All right, everyone, I'd like you to welcome Seth Ladd. Um, I met this guy years ago in Miami at the Spring Experience, and we've, we've touched bases a few times over the years. And, uh, and she was surprising in the night. Exactly, yeah. Um, so when he joined Google, I wanted to think a little about talking to us about Chrome like a year ago. That didn't quite work out, but now he's working with uh, Dart. We waited for the really the new new thing. <laughs> exactly. Anyway, thanks everyone for taking their time. My name is Seth, a uh, developer advocate with the Chrome team. So I help partners of all different sizes get up and running on all our cool stuff. And Chrome is this massive thing. So we have obviously Chrome browser, uh, Chrome OS, Chromebooks, Chrome Frame, HTML5, Chrome Web Store, uh, JavaScript. And what's near and dear to my heart is Dart. And so that's why I'm happy to be talking to you guys today. Um, before I dive into it, I want to talk a little bit about kind of my perspective. I know I was talking to Christian a little bit. And thanks again for having me. Um, uh, why this is interesting to me and why I think we all need to pay attention to what this project is trying to do and say. Uh, my first language was C. So I kind of jumped in the deep end way back in the day. and. Uh, Later on, then Java came out, and Java was really interesting to me because I, I was more interested in computer science because I got I wanted to get stuff done, uh, so I was more of the pragmatic mind at that time. So to me, Java was just an easier way to get stuff done: garbage collection, bundled classes and libraries. Like that was awesome. Whole SDK I shit with it. What was really cool about Java at the time was that uh, it actually it was kind of of and for the web. I mean. At that time, applets was a thing people were trying to get working. Obviously, it didn't really play out, but I like the idea of that concept. And, um, it had a formal URL class, right? I mean, you could actually load Java classes, Java bytecode, over the network into your virtual, like that, that was mind-blowing at the time. And to see kind of a modern object-oriented programming language native in a network world was like light bulbs going off for me. So I really, really dove into that. Um, obviously, Java became kind of relegated to the server side. Um, but still a lot of these, you know, still pretty productive. Uh, later on then, uh, I wanted to be even more productive, and so I found Ruby on Rails, and I know you guys are a big Rails shop, and so I really took to that. Uh, but I was able to bring over a lot of the uh, software engineering principles and practices that kind of grew up with uh, programming C and Java. Um, a lot of design patterns kind of came over. A lot of the expectations around tooling and refactoring, all that. Uh, maybe not refactoring so much, but certainly tooling, unit testing, design patterns, object orientation, all this good stuff. And I felt definitely more productive. And then I was extremely lucky to get this gig at Google and Chrome. And I remember uh, I was really kind of interviewing for App Engine, it's the best service I got. They're like, actually, you're going to be good for Chrome. And so I wrote them an email and I said, uh, um, I don't really know JavaScript that, that well. I mean, I can get it to do stuff, but I'm not a JavaScript ninja. Um, and they're like, ah, don't worry about it. Um, so lucky enough, I'm still, I'm still there even without being a JavaScript ninja. But um, I did learn through the job and through these uh, opportunities just how totally powerful and awesome the browser is. And so I was able to kind of make the shift of, oh, everything has to be done on the server, because that's where the power is, to wait a minute. There's actually a really capable browser now with a tremendous amount of APIs and fast execution engines. And OK, cool. I can see, I can see how these two worlds can kind of complement each other. But I was never able to fully dive in with the full set of expectations that I had from my experience on the other platform. And again, that's as much on me as anything else. Um, but when I heard about this Dart project, uh, the light bulbs again kind of went off because it said, OK, this is a, a structured platform allowing me to develop software that I, or meeting the needs and expectations of developers like me yet deliver software for the browser, which is the most ubiquitous platform out there and getting more powerful every day. And so again, light bulbs go off and say, this is something I want to pay attention to. This is something I want to help out with. So um, happy to use this time to talk about kind of the philosophy and motivations around Dart and, and show you some of the code and just give you an idea of where the project at and, and where it's going. So our, is, okay, cool. uh, our goal is to help app developers from all different platforms, right, complex, high-performance client apps for the modern web. Okay, so you can see the words that's missing up here. The word Dart actually isn't on here. And that, that's on purpose. This is about, the Dart project is about ensuring the web remains a compelling and productive environment for app developers. We, inside Chrome, in fact, back when Chrome launched, we thought, this is the browser for web apps. Uh, 
Turns out we're a little ahead of the time, so speed, simplicity, and security was kind of the message that resonated with people. We always had in the back of our heads, people should be writing apps. It's more than just kind of interactive sites and pages. Um, and so if you're able to do really large scale uh, app development with you know, JavaScript, JavaScript, or whatever you're doing, that's fantastic. We think that there's room in, in, uh, on the web, room in the world for developer choice. And as long as everyone's kind of going towards this goal of complex, uh, multi-feature, high-performance apps are running in the browser, that's what we want to see and what, what we want to help make happen. We think Dart, Dart is a way to do that. Uh, so the tagline is Structured Web Programming. Um, it's really an entire batteries included platform. It's not just a language. Uh, certainly there's language, but there's also tools like an editor, there's a virtual machine, there's a course of libraries, um, and probably most importantly, it compiles the JavaScript. Again, if you think back to the previous slide, what we are really just trying to do is help people deliver awesome apps for the web. Uh, so it has to work on the entire modern web. Um, it's a totally open source project announced actually not too long ago, just in October of last year. Uh, it's all in Google code. And I'll probably say this many times, but do keep in mind that the entire project is still technology preview. Um, so what does that mean? So when we launched in October and still today, well, when we launched in October even more, uh, things were generally compiling. Uh, we had some core libraries. We had virtual machine had a lot of features, but not all. Uh, so you can see the direction the project was going in, but it's very, very early, still it is early in the project. Uh, and we launched so we can get that feedback, so we can hear from app developers like you guys what you need. Uh, and so we're not even in an alpha state yet, but hopefully you can see where we're going. But there's still time to send that feedback in and help direct the project. Okay, so we're gonna try to cover a lot of stuff. I don't know how much time we have. Uh, we'll get as much as we can. Um, motivation, languages, we'll look at some of the cool new features of language. We're not gonna look at the whole thing. <coughs> Uh, we'll look at some code and we'll look at what's new. Okay. Uh, so the current web, right? People are obviously developing apps on the web today. There's certainly a lot of good parts about that. Uh, small to medium apps are still easy to develop. Um, you can see that over and over again. You know, how many startups, how many businesses, how many, and everyone launches a web app. Um, it's still easy to do kind of the smaller things. Uh, platform independence is obviously a key feature of the platform. Right? You can write JavaScript and HTML code and get on every operating system that you can think of. And if you uh, look hard enough on modern uh, smartphones, uh, no application installation is great. You can click a link and you're there. Um, and not only does that technically just is a great feature of the web, but not that, that clicking a blue link and delivering a new app just on, on the next page refresh also has a great social contract with users. And they know that clicking that blue link is not going to eat their computer. And that, that's really great. Um, supporting incremental development. I mean, the web does that really well. There's a couple different things I mean there. One is you can start off by just writing a couple functions, add more functions. You know, you can start small and grow. Um, also deploying a web app, you can deploy just one more file, right? You don't have, you don't have to think of large distri distribution bundles. Uh, the platform is improving tremendously fast. It's, very hard even for us to keep up with all the new HTML5 features and APIs. Um, and this last point is, is really near and dear to my heart. Uh, I helped bring Angry Birds to the web, and to me, Angry Birds is kind of a, a litmus test of modern browsers. So to run Angry Birds, you need uh, a modern JavaScript engine, and you need hardware acceleration for the graphics, and you need features like the app cache to run offline. So to me, that's kind of like, if you can run Angry Birds in your browser, then you're running a modern browser. And when I look last, this is a couple months old, uh, greater than 50% of the all desktop, laptop, notebook, web users can play Angry Birds. It's across all different browsers. And that's, I don't know how many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of people that is. So to me, that, that is a really, really big number. And uh, to me, that says we're crossing over that threshold of not thinking twice about delivering apps that use these awesome features because you're going to have such a large user base. So that's all good. However, we believe that developing large apps is still very challenging. Uh, it's hard to find the program structure. Uh, it's hard to kind of look at a large JavaScript app today and understand where the modules, where the components, where the libraries had to put together, where does the program start. Um, we believe that the lack of static types uh, is a hindrance uh, when you think of the benefits they give you in terms of tooling or just just documentation in general. Like I was trying to port some JavaScript libraries to Dart, and 
I have no idea what the parameters are to methods. Like, you just don't know unless you manually kind of trace through the program structure. I think we can do better than that. Um, it's taken a very long time to have decent JavaScript tools. Uh, WebStorm, for instance, is a pretty good web editor today. And it's like only it's less than a year old. I think the, the new version that does all the stuff that we'd expect. It still doesn't do everything that we have on other platforms. And we should ask ourselves, why don't we have better tool support? Um, and we believe that even though these engines like V8 are getting faster and faster every release, pure startup time is actually too slow. You still have to parse all of those scripts as text to start an app. I mean, that's insane if every time you start up your uh, your desktop, and like Chrome, and to parse your C code. Like, we can definitely do better. And then you can kind of just think, well, the web has been around for 15 plus years, and there's a lot of cuff there. And certainly, a strength of the web is the first original web page still renders in today's browsers. Like, that is amazing. And that's not anything I want to get rid of. But there are pieces like deep in the kind of dark alleyways and corners of the API uh, that we kind of question, like, is that is that does that still need to be there? And there's we don't really have a way to kind of deprecate on the web. Um, wouldn't it be interesting if like what would happen if somebody kind of took a fresh look? So that kind of brings us to the dark platform. So we kind of look at the good parts, we look at the parts we're going to improve, and at least on the, from the team's perspective, we can look at the experience we have, both inside Google and the different teams inside Google, um, building things like Closure Compiler, uh, which uh, doesn't really have a vocal developer adoption, but I talked to a lot of people, and they love this tool. Uh, Gwit, Google Web Toolkit, which again, kind of enables these larger structured web apps. Um, Google itself develops large apps like Google Docs, Gmail, Google Plus itself is like really complex almost an entirely script-driven app. Um, and certainly the team building kind of the, uh, the low-level components like V8. So we take all of that experience, uh, and then what if we can package it all up and make it available to the entire modern web and make it feel like it's very webby? That's what we're trying to do with the Dark Platform. And by the way, since uh, it's awesome, there's kind of a small crowd, so feel free to stop me at any time. It's way more interesting to go two-way. Um, I hope we get to the point where I learn from you uh, what well, your experiences are developing web apps and kind of your take on this stuff, so don't hesitate. <coughs> and I know we talked about this a little bit, but we firmly believe that innovation is essential. I think I saw some quote, um, I forget from who, I think it was related to Dart, that uh, no one has a monopoly on innovation for the web. And we feel very strongly about that. I mean, when you look at the kind of formal title, it's open web platform. And to me, open means Everyone has an open, free shot at grassroots, kind of groundswell support, improving out these ideas. And the community should embrace that. The community should embrace people trying different things. And not everything's going to work. But uh, we don't want anyone to say, you can't try. Uh, and we I kind of already talked about you know, that the aim of this project is to maintain the web as relevant, interesting, productive, pleasurable to app developers uh, from all platforms. OK, cool. So no questions about that. You can stop me anytime. Um, let's dive into the language. This is a code heavy talk, those we have learned. But I do want to call out a couple of different features that might be interesting to you guys. Um, so, just a high level overview of Dart language it's a simple, unsurprising, object oriented programming language with interfaces and single inheritance. At that point, you can just yawn and kind of go to sleep and check your email and stuff. Um, but that's pretty much exactly the response that we want to get. Uh, we believe that. The language itself should be very familiar to developers on a wide spectrum. And the Dark Project is not the time or place for us to invent like, the next Haskell. And even though that might be totally awesome to programming language as a discipline, uh, we'd end up with like six users. And uh, the Dark platform or project is trying to appeal to an army of web developers and an army of Java developers and an army of C-sharp developers. And, and so innovating on things like language syntax it's not gonna. It's not gonna help people easily get up on this platform. Uh, so we take a very familiar, familiar approach to this language. But that doesn't mean that we don't take this opportunity to introduce a couple new things or clean up a couple of things. So we'll look at look at some of that stuff. Probably the uh, to me the coolest thing that the Dart project is trying to do is introduce optional static typing. Now it's not the first <laughs> language to do this, but arguably it's the first language which is targeted to kind of mass adoption to try optional static typing. Um, the best way to think about optional static typing is they're simply annotations. They're simply documentation. It's, 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 it's a way for you to communicate your intent to your other developers and your fellow machines. Um, 
So I don't know the background uh, in, in this room, but like if you kind of come from structured languages, you're like, well, obviously I want static types. They tell my tools a lot. They tell my fellow developers a lot. Yes, these are great things. But again, there's an army of web developers out there writing JavaScript that have never seen a type, may never want to see a type, and this platform should appeal to them. Uh, so again, you kind of look at the spectrum, right, of, of JavaScript guys who may want to validate a form, all the way out to people who want to build like abstract factory class factories, right? and everything kind of in between, right? Um, optional static types is our effort to allow you to kind of gradually get familiar with the language and then gradually add types as you see fit, and then just more and more benefits start to appear. Um, kind of philosophically, we don't want to introduce any kind of uh, strong-handed type theorem checker that beats you over the head, um, especially when you kind of take the perspective of incremental development is really important, especially to the web. So you should be able to write code that doesn't exactly work perfectly because you may not actually run that code yet. And so you should be able to write a little code and refresh, write a little code and refresh. That's the cycle we want to get. You can't have that in more structured languages that have mandatory static types. But there are a lot of benefits to static types. So optional static types is our effort to, to make to make both of these scenarios work well. Uh, and so before I dive more into those, I'm going to explain how optional static types might be applied. And it's important to understand that um, the two kind of runtime modes for Dart. So the default mode of Dart programs, the, the, the mode that when you ship a Dart program, a user kind of hits the URL and goes, is what we call production mode. Production mode is the fast, the fast way, the default way to run the code. It's uh, more or less ignoring uh, the uh, static type annotations. In fact, the static type when the annotations have no runtime, some, they don't affect the runtime semantics. Uh, so it's great for when you deploy. But when you develop or write unit tests and are, are, are just kind of building out your program, you want to run what's in called in checked mode. Check mode, you start to see benefits of these static types uh, because dynamic type assertions turn on. And for instance, if you try to assign a, an integer to a string or something, uh, the dynamic type assertion will kick in throw that exception and say, hey, you're doing something I don't think you really meant to do. Uh, I'm going to stop you and, and, and let you fix that. And again, this is a developer time choice. You can say, I'm going to run the check mode, I'm going to get all these benefits. Uh, assert statements are turned on, um, and we believe it's really, really good for development. So, now that we understand the two different runtime modes, uh, let's look back at optional static types. So, during development time, the optional static types give you, for instance, the ability to run an intelligent static analysis. Again, somebody coming from Java or C Sharp is like, of course I have this stuff. So we have this too in Dart. Um, if you're typing along and it notices something is incorrect, it's going to give you a little squiggly and say that's not exactly what you thought. Um, it is tuned to be unobtrusive, so we do prefer warnings and not errors. Again, because you should be able to write code and hit refresh and run. Or again, we're not trying to make you jump through a tremendous amount of hoops just to run your program. Um, and then again, in depth time, all your dynamic, all your static types enable these dynamic type checks. Boom. Okay. So uh, back over in runtime, this is a little misleading slide. I'm gonna have to fix this. Um, in check. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, yeah. So this is development time. This is when you're when you're writing the code. The warnings can all turn on and they can static and analyze. This is in runtime. So you're still in check mode, but while your program is running, that's when all the type assertions turn on. If you hit that code. It can throw the exception for you. So you can do warnings while you code, uh, exceptions catch during check mode as you execute. And so, for instance, um, you might write something like t x is equal to o, then in check mode, this is going to be automatically inserted in your code. And this is really cool. So if you try to assign something that's not t, it's going to warn you. That's cool. Okay. So let's see an example of this stuff work. And uh, I think I can. <clears throat> okay, so now I'm in the Dart editor, and I'm going to create a uh, uh, server. And we'll dive into this a little bit more later. But okay, so here's a simple Dart program. We're going to just illustrate these kind of modes. Um, so let's say your buddy uh, down the hall is like, "Yeah, dude, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write you a method. It's going to be awesome, and it's going to do this." Okay. You're like, yes, I totally need to add stuff. And thankfully, my buddy did that. So, okay, so let's try to run this. Okay, I probably can't see it, but here's three. Just as you would expect if you look at this code today. So that's, that's cool. Um, but then later on, everybody's like, oh, well, actually, really, what I meant is uh, this, because that's what I needed in my code. 
Okay. So uh, he goes and adds the type annotations to the program, thus being a lot more clear about what add does. Okay, that cool. And then I don't know if you can see it, but now the static analysis right can kick on and say, well, obviously int uh, one is an integer, and you told me that you're going to take a string. So hey, int is not assignable to string. Heads up, this may not be what you want. Uh, okay, but it's a warning, not an error. So if we run this program, still runs. Because I'm running in production mode, and remember the type annotations don't affect the runtime semantics. So I can concatenate two strings together, everything's fine. Um, however, let's go on and do this, and we're gonna run in checked mode. Uh, okay, so now I'm in like development, and I wanna know these things. So now the check mode is turned on, it's gonna actually stop the program and throw an exception that you can catch and do whatever it is before. Int is not a subtype, a string of x. So now my program is helping me as a developer, adding two simple words, string and string. Now you get all these benefits. And again, if you come from other platforms, you're like, yes, of course, I love it. Uh, but we're trying to create a type system that doesn't get in your way, but helps you. And that's where the warning's there. So that's, that's what's going on. OK, cool. So let's look at some other uh, new features of the platform. One is isolates. We'll look at some samples of this in a little bit. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Erlang, but Erlang, uh, kind of popular, was quite successful with this idea of uh, actor-based concurrency. We should be able to start up these uh, isolated actors in the system, totally memory isolated, and you pass messages back and forth. It's, uh, many believe, a much safer way to run, uh, write multi, um, uh, or parallel code, concurrent code, uh, because nothing's actually shared. And so Dart takes, takes a lot of uh, inspiration from this, and so we built a system called isolates. Isolates are memory isolated uh, chunks of running code, and you communicate between them via messages. And these messages are copied back and forth. So we get all the benefits of no shared state concurrent programming, uh, and a simple library that's just built into the platform. There's also a pragmatic reason why uh, we have this is because Dart is single threaded, and if you know, JavaScript is also single threaded. So one of the core tenets of Dart is that everything has to compile to JavaScript in some fairly sane way. So we couldn't build threads into Dart because how would you get that? You want to map those to web workers, but web workers don't have shared state like thread do. You know, so anyway, we built out isolates, and uh, it's pretty cool. So lightweight units of execution. Um, so what are they good for? Well, certainly concurrency, right? Everyone has multi-core machines. Even your phones are getting multi-core, so we have to have an answer to concurrency. Um, you think about any multi, uh, modern web page today, it's just full of uh, injected JavaScript, like uh, your plus one button, and your Facebook like, and your Twitter button, and ads, and analytics, and you name it. And it's just like all jammed in there on the page. And if you don't write the code perfectly, and if that, that third party library doesn't create iframes and all this other stuff, you're basically kind of all operating the same heap. I mean, like mess. So uh, wouldn't it be interesting if each one of those could be an isolate? And you did just have a lot more confidence that your app's not going to trample on each other and have to have an uh, easier way to do it other than iframes. Another interesting uh, usage of isolates is what if you can mask client and server communication just like you can uh, use isolates to communicate or channels to communicate or ports to communicate between isolates in a running Dart app. It would be interesting if you just extrapolate that and have an isolate between the client and server. You just post messages and it just takes care of it for you. So we see a couple of uses for isolates. Uh, first and foremost, Dart is a web programming language, and uh, again, this is our chance to kind of look back at the platform and the API and say, what would we do differently if we did it again today? Um, and I think jQuery really pioneered this, right? Anybody's JavaScript developer pretty much is a jQuery developer. Everyone injects the same 30k of JavaScript into every single app everyone writes. Um, and there's a very good reason for that. They made the DOM feel natural to the endemic programming language. You know, they made the DOM feel like JavaScript. It was awesome. Uh, so, of course, Dart's going to take inspiration from that, and we're building out what we call the HTML library uh, to make interacting with the DOM feel very natural to Dart. So, uh, collections of nodes or children should just be Dart collections. And the method name should look like what you might call them if you're programming Dart. Um, and we also take this opportunity to clean up, so we remove some of the dark corners and alleyways of the API we think you shouldn't be touching. Um, and we'll look at an example of that. Okay. All right, this is a preamble to the next slide. So let's look at how you might execute uh, Dart. So you're, you always start out with the Dart source. Um, now you may execute that Dart source directly in the Dart virtual machine. This is part of the Dart platform. 
the Dark Virtual Machine runs just fine on the, on the server or on the command line, much like JavaScript runs fine on the command line, which powers Node.js. You have, you have Dart executable here, too. This can be embedded also in a browser. We have a beta version of that. Or you can take your Dart server and run it through some tools. So some of your tools might be a compiler to JavaScript, which is totally critical to the adoption of Dart and just being a citizen on the web. Or you might run it through a tool that can generate snapshots. That's what I want to talk about. So snapshots of the Dart VMs are answer to running, uh, to fix the slow startup performance problem we see with current web applications today. So wouldn't it be amazing if you could start your app from cache, say, on your local device, from a snapshot, a serialization of the heap from the last time you ran your program. We've seen, when we did this, when we tested it, we saw an order of magnitude improvement of load time. And this stuff adds up. Like, you may think that apps start fast now because V8 kind of executes fast, but again, when you know they can get order of magnitude better, and we've shown time and time again, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, every time you increase the speed or decrease uh, latency, your revenues go up. The usage goes up. There's a direct correlation between speed and bottom line, the dollars. Um, so this stuff is important. Um, Snapshotting is a feature of the virtual machine, um, but uh, pretty cool, so keep your eye on that one. Okay, so this is some of the features about the language, and we'll look at it a little bit more later. So, But I want to now shift to the other elements of the platform, like the tools. We saw the editor real briefly. Uh, we believe that tooling is as important as just shipping language back or a virtual machine. So we built an editor based on RCP. We basically just took the widgeting components and built an editor only for making Dart, uh, editing Dart kind of a, a fun, pleasurable experience. So things like syntax highlighting, which we saw, uh, code completion, um, warnings and errors that like we saw there too. Um, it can fire off the Dart virtual machine, it can fire off Dartium, which is the Dart VM inside <coughs> Chrome. Um, it can debug between the two. It's, it's the things you might expect in an editor, but it doesn't, it's not trying to be like an IDE because that implies like this massive monolithic thing and, and web developers are, they want very fast kind of golden paths to that stuff. Uh, so you see a lot of people use Sublime Text and TextMate. So we're trying to build something that gives you the features that play off the language benefits, yet still remains lightweight like a text editor. And, uh, so that's our goal there. Uh, there's always the SDK. If you just love living on the command line, you'll, and this is all downloadable stuff today. Um, the SDK has Dart 2JS. This is your compiler to JavaScript. It has the Dart virtual machine built in. It has all the core libraries. Uh, we just put the unit test in there, I believe. We put the, doc, the Dart doc util in there. So that, that's where our command line utility is going to live. Um, and just like all the stuff, you can download this and play with it today. And then there's Chromium with the Dart virtual machine. Uh, this ships in the editor download today, and it's just like what it sounds. We took the Dart VM, put it in Chromium, uh, wired up all the bindings. So just like you might communicate with HTML5 APIs with JavaScript, you can communicate with those same APIs with Dart. Uh, the dev tools also work, and we'll see this in a second. Um, so it'll be a while before this is actually deployed out into the wild. Uh, so what's really awesome about this is the editor, uh, the editor debug development cycle. Right? Um, I don't know, does anyone play with Gwit? Who went for Gwit? So you write a bunch of Java code, then there's a compile step, then you reload. And there's a dev mode, which made it a little bit better. And just recently they had a super dev mode. Uh, but there is this cycle, right, where you have to compile. Um, but what's awesome about JavaScript and web programming today? Reload code? Reload. Like, reload is the web's compile. We want that experience for Dart developers, so you can write code in the editor and run it in Dartium. Uh, run, debug, run, debug, run, debug, and then when you're ready to deploy, then you compile the JavaScript and ship out. So uh, this will be an awesome development and debug tool for uh, a while. Christian? How do you see, the, like, what's the future of Dart in non-Chromium browsers? Uh, I think that the Dart team has work to do to finish up the platform. We're still missing things like reflection, um, increase the speed, uh, increase developer productivity. We're still in technology preview. Uh, so I think rightfully so, people are in a wait and see approach. Um, and that's that's fair, right? That's the pragmatic thing. Right? They, they're waiting to see how Dart uh, can deliver on these on these uh, hypotheses, if you will, for modern web development. Um, so you know, we'll see what happens. But it, it's still early, so we've got work to do to prove out prove out these these theories. Is this the improvement based on comparing JavaScript versus Dart in Chromium, or is it based on um, the code produced from Dart versus? Uh, both. We track the performance of both Dart compiled to JavaScript and native Dart. I know, I know. And, and, and tested in another browser. Absolutely. Yeah, and it, um, 
our build bot is public, and you can go to the build bot and you see all these things running on all the different browsers. Okay. Um, and there's there's definitely work to do with performance for sure, but we are tracking. Are you seeing a performance improvement on other browsers if you if you start from? I, I guess I guess that's hard to measure. Huh? If you start from the Dart language and it. it Optimizes in some way. So this is something that GWT does. GWT can take your Java code, compile it, and optimize it for different browsers, understanding their particular quirks. Um, Dart's not yet doing that because Dart. One of the GWT's things was like back when they started, uh, we're going to make this work on IE6. Um, there's a vast discrepancy there. Uh, Dart's targeting modern browsers, um, so that means IE9 and up, basically. So you're going to see the speed improvement one only on Chromium. That, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go that far. Uh, in fact, again, in many cases, we don't actually see speed improvements yet because it's very early in the game. Yeah. So what I suspect is that if you write fairly sane dark code, mm -hmm. we have a lot of smarts that generate optimized JavaScript. Um, it remains to be seen how much we'll tweak that JavaScript for each browser. But because we're targeting modern browsers who have fairly decent JavaScript engines, the need for us to micro-tweak at, like on day one for Dart is greatly minimized. Okay. Yeah. I also have a couple clarifying kind of questions. Yeah. Okay, so uh, it sounds like there's kind of two paths to see benefit through Dart. So I could run, just to clarify, so yeah. one way I could... Um, Do you want to go uh, back to this guy right sure. here? Uh, I could this run, yeah, so in the Dart source editor, I could run pure JavaScript if I want to. In the Dart source, in the Dart editor I showed yeah, you earlier? Yeah, I could run pure JavaScript. Well, you can definitely write pure JavaScript, like you can write HTML, CSS. The editor will treat those as text files, but every modern web app has a collection of different text file formats. I, I think I'm misunderstanding. Okay, if so I, let's if go. If I to... type in JavaScript purely into the Dart editor, into this guy running, right here. will it run? Or does it? Okay, so the, the, that's, text like, text. that's not valid syntax. I know, I'm, I, I yeah. So let me explain. So, when this is an editor, so it understands, um, it natively understands Dart code, which is why you see kind of that stuff showing up. I can totally do I, I guess I'm just I'm going to mix, mix the code at all. Yep, yeah, I'm, I'm getting it. Okay, so, so now you've edited it, mean, you're good. Now I want to run. So there's two different ways you can run the code. One is the way I showed you, well, three maybe. One is the way that I showed you, it will run it straight on the virtual machine, which we saw down here, this is just what's being spit out from the yeah. um, Let's go ahead and jump to this guy, this will make hopefully sense to you. Are you going to tell me that it'll compile the JavaScript? Yes. I've already got that. Yes. But I was wondering, I guess I, I, I thought that maybe you could start from JavaScript and slowly add implementation details if you can't. Like if you have some JavaScript already and you want to convert it to Dart and then you know experiment with that. Got it. Okay. Good yes. question. That's a good clarification. Okay. So the question was, can you use the editor or not? Can you start with JavaScript and slowly convert it to Dart? You kind of have these two worlds like And the mix. answer is no, you have to start with Dart. Um, so the answer is Dart does not have uh, uh, Jisney or something like what has like JavaScript native interface, mm -hmm. Dart can't directly, directly synchronously interact with JavaScript. Okay. And the reason for that is when you have two virtual machines, it gets a little complicated, like who owns object and garbage collection and uh, efficient RPC mechanism between the two. And so the way that you interact or interoperate with JavaScript in Dart today is via post message. Just like you might interact between two iframes or two tabs or two disparate third party programs, post message is how you do that. So, what we see people do is they look at, they have like a, they might have JavaScript code, they write a layer that turns that JavaScript code into a coarse grain asynchronous interface that's in Dart, and then the implementation of that interface just uses post message communicate back to the main page. So, it's definitely not a totally awesome experience. So when but I start, it does work. <laughs> when I start from Dart specifically, do I kind of have like two options on creating the JavaScript? I can create it pretty so that like people working with in just pure JavaScript and not Dart are happy, or does it just convert to Dart optimized JavaScript? You know okay. I mean? um, so the pretty and the op Dart optimized are right now the same thing. We generate just one version of the JavaScript. In fact, I think we'll see that really soon. I'll, I'll actually show you um, to tie back to this experience here. The editor can both launch this thing directly in Dartium, or it can compile the JavaScript for you and launch it in another browser. Okay. Um, so how awful is debugging generally? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, fair question. Um, the JavaScript that we generate today is fairly readable, and I'll show you really quickly. But how easily can I map it back to the Dart I wrote? So, uh, so I we don't yet have source maps today. Okay. Um, 
that would be really awesome, and I know that's been brought up a couple of times. E even by hand, right? Like, I, I find CoffeeScript hard enough to realize I did something wrong. So it's not a tool problem, it's that I wrote invalid code, yeah. but it compiled and executed JavaScript that didn't do what I wanted. And I find the line of JavaScript that generated the behavior in, that wasn't intended, yeah. but then locating which process the compiled statement generated that, is that feasible? It's totally feasible if we implement source maps. <laughs> yeah. I, I, if, for those who right. don't know, source maps allows you to map between the compiled output <clears throat> And the original source, and so when you're actually in the Dev Tools, then you're as you step through the program, it'll actually step you through the source, the original source, even though it's executing the generated JavaScript code. Um, but we're gonna get that really quick. I'll show you what a generated JavaScript code looks like, um, and it's it basically looks like a human wrote it. So yeah, yeah. Let's look at that then, and then I'll show you. Sure. Yeah, great question. Yeah. Uh, ah, okay. Oh, look at that, it's actually the next slide, very cool. Okay, so kind of completing the, the tools that we offer, there's the Dart to JavaScript compiler as well, which is how you kind of deploy your app today for all modern browsers. It used to be called Frog, affectionately, but now it's simplified to Dart to JS, and everyone's <laughs> like, what's Frog? Um, so it does do some smarts out of the gate today. It does do what we call tree shaking. So it actually, it compiles in your whole program, and then shakes the tree, and then all the unused or dead code falls off, and we only ship what's actually being used which is really cool because that means you can import just any, any all these libraries, but if you use just 10% of the library you import, then what gets generated out is just that 10%. So that's pretty cool. And there's more work to do to make it even smaller. And once you understand the semantics of the code, your minification can get a lot smarter, and so we'll add minification into the tool chain as well. Okay, so to answer your questions, here's an example. This is slightly old, but uh, you get the idea. So. Okay, um, here's some Dart code. This is pretty self-explanatory. You have a class here. This is a static method, and here's your main method that calls a static method. Okay, so this is what you would write in a program. Then you run it through the Dart to JS compiler, and that in this version of, of Frog, this is the code that it generates. So it actually fits on a screen. Uh, yep. Yeah, okay. Um, and we have main method here. Uh, that's that's fine. That makes sense. In fact, this looks like the same name and method. Okay, that's good. Then you look back up here, so there's a class, okay, so that's that guy here, the static method, so that actually, to me, is fairly understandable. Um, so, will we, this is just one example, obviously, if you write really complex Dart code, you might, the Dart compiler should be smart enough to optimize that, but we're not at the gate trying to make purposely confusing or crazy JavaScript code. Like, the, the development and debug experience for JavaScript should be fairly sane and logical to us. And uh, so that's where we are today. Hopefully that helps. Okay. Um, so it's important to remember, though, that we're still in technology preview, so Dart is by no means done. There's still key features like reflection that are currently still being implemented. Um, we're, in fact, we just changed the semantics for equality, you know, so changes are still happening. Um, we don't yet have an enum. That's probably pretty useful. Pattern matching is really useful. If you have isolate communication of messages, we don't really have that. Um, and of course, there's a whole question of, well, how do we ship Dart in Chrome? Um, so still early on, uh, and this is why we like to get the feedback to know like what's important to you guys. Now, I hear the, the, the debugging of JavaScript is really important, so we, you know, that's the stuff we need here. Okay. Um, ah, so this is really cool. Just FYI, one of the things that's really important to any kind of ecosystem is a way to kind of get developers feel empowered to share, publish, use, install, discover libraries, right? Um, Java has Maven, Node.js has NPM, uh, Ruby has Gems and Bundler. So Dart is building what we call, affectionately called Pub, to play Dart instead of Pub. Um, and that's our package manager. And it'll do things like enable uh, installation, discovery, uh, bundling, all that good stuff. And, and to me, this is, this is one of those key missing pieces that once we launch, you, you'll now see this kind of ecosystem because we have all these libraries out there right now, but there's no canonical way to pull them all in right now. Um, so anyway, we're keenly aware about developer experience, and this is the kind of things that we, we feel are part of the batteries of the new Dart package. Uh, the proposal is live right now, and it's you can add comments to this and respond, and that's the kind of stuff we like to hear. Okay, how much time do we have? 15 minutes or so? Okay, cool. This, we're not gonna go into these then, but this just gives you know, people are building things, but 
excuse me, Dart today, uh, crypto libraries, MVC frameworks, uh, logging, all the kind of like infrastructure things you think would happen in early days. So in other words, people are building stuff, and uh, it's neat to watch them and, uh, and, and build upon what other people have built already kind of so early on in the project. Uh, the online kind of community is also growing. We have uh, plus pages, hashtags, Twitter. Um, Dartosphere is what they call a planet, right? So like all the blog aggregations there. Um, Dartbug.com is a, a short URL over to the bug tracker. We love that. Uh, a blog here for news. Um, so it's, it's happening online as well, like that. Um, here's some resources you might find useful just to kind of make you aware. We have a language tour uh, where you can um, just walk yourself through like at a high level all of these different features. Uh, we have API docs which have comments as well so you can browse around. Again, what are the bundle libraries, things like futures, I think that's really useful for asynchronous programming, timers, clocks, date manipulation. This is one of the things I love about Java, it's shipped with a pretty comprehensive core library. And if you need it, the web platform had this too. That's less code and you can ship around there. Uh, so you can browse around that. Uh, and then this one's really cool. This is, you can't see the whole thing, but this translates JavaScript idioms uh, to Dart. And so this can kind of help you if you're a JavaScript guy and, uh, or gal and you want to know, like, I'm always iterating through arrays and Dart. How about I do that in Dart? Does that make sense? You can use this. This is a huge page. Um, this itself is written with Dart and oddly enough, XSLT. Found a good use for it. <laughs> So uh, anyway, that's pretty useful for that. And then Shameless Plug, this is a free ebook, kind of high-level stuff. You can get that right into the free. Um, so yeah, I mean, the main themes is start, start is getting ready. It's not quite done. But we envision it as a full batteries included platform. Language, libraries, editors, virtual machines, browser integrations. Um, we view it as for structured web programming. Um, so we kind of have a set of use cases in mind. We kind of have, um, we're working with a set of assumptions around that. Um, and we love feedback. There's many ways you can do it. Mailing lists, bugs, um, uh, the plus feed, whatever, my email, it's all good. So with a few minutes left, I'll show you a couple more code samples, and then you know, whatever questions you guys have. Uh, Are there any internal teams that have signed up to start developing with this? Uh, I don't know if we're talking about that kind of stuff. No comment. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So let's start here. Uh, you saw this, probably makes sense to you. This is just the obligatory hello world. What I like about this, though, is it's very obvious, it's very familiar, and there's nothing really surprising here. But it also doesn't have all this ceremonious garbage that Java would have. Uh, so you know, again, we can be structured and familiar without making you type out public static void main blah 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 blah. Still get across the same point. I know where my program starts. That's actually something you don't know about JavaScript. OK, um, that's kind of cool. Let's look at a class. This is a little bit artificial, but it shows a couple of things I like about this. Hopefully, you guys can see this. Um, class, again, the syntax looks really familiar. Class points. Um, you can see the optional typing here. Uh, var just works just fine. Um, what I love is this, the syntactic sugar for constructors. You always type this.x equals x, this.y equals y. Why not just say this.x, this.y? Cool, works for me. Um, you can see the static method being called on that here. Um, one of the things that we love, uh, or we're beginning to see is, we do this, is using the, the static type of annotations, kind of the surface area of your code. Again, to provide documentation to your fellow humans and machines, really what we want to encourage is putting, using type, type, type annotations here and here, this, also will flow down to this. Um, so that when you give the code to a fellow programmer, and you immediately see what the expectations are. Like that, to me, it's just that alone is a huge improvement over what we have uh, today. And then, for instance, once you start doing that kind of stuff, uh, let's just run this and solve this. Okay, cool. Uh, okay. Right, so it obviously doesn't know how to complete this, um, but if I do, if I tell the system its point, then uh, the system gets a lot more smart, and obviously the things you begin to expect from any kind of modern programming environment kick in, boom, a lot more productive. So I like that kind of stuff. Um, there's been talk about, well, could we not enable local type inference? And that would be kind of cool, and I think that would, that's, would come at some point. That would make sense. Um, so some of you have questions about that. And then let's look at 
Uh, we saw this guy before, but so this is an example of the what we call the HTML library. Um, again, totally artificial example here, but it shows you that um, this looks a little bit more jQuery-esque, if you will. Um, you create uh, new elements with this nice, uh, this is called a named constructor, which I love named constructors because before you have just overloaded constructors with different combinations of arguments, you never knew like what they were for or what they did. So now you have a constructor, for instance, like from JSON. Okay, good, makes sense. Um, and then you know you can just interact with the attributes of the element just as you might properties of the class, right? So ID, text, um, classes here is just a dark collection. So just like you can add things in our collection, you can add a class that just works. Um, and this is how you had an anonymous uh, event callback, if you will, to the click handler. Reads pretty easy to me on click add. Um, and then again, elements is a dark collection, so you just add it. Um, your, your new element to the elements of the body. So let's run this. this inside what we call Darium, which is the dark version machine. Uh, sorry, embedded inside Chromium, and here we go, okay. Um, just to prove that it all works. Okay, great. So to answer sort of your debugging question, this isn't exactly what you asked, but it kind of shows you the direction that the, the team is going in. Um, I can fire up the dev tools, sorry, I'm getting in the way here. Uh, the dev tools are awesome for JavaScript, and we're making those work in dark as well. So for instance, you can set a breakpoint here, and notice this is the dark code. Um, you go back up here, and sure enough, it's stopped right here. You can inspect objects. It's really cool, just like you would expect in, in DevTools for JavaScript. And we'll just keep going, and it all works. And so uh, the debugger experience here should be great, and what they're working on now is actually wiring in the debugger of the editor communicating directly with the virtual machine in here, so you should use the editor to step through and inspect variables and all that stuff, kind of living in a, in a nice development experience and running it natively in the browser. Um, finally, I want to show isolates. This is the kind of cool stuff I like. Um, remember isolates is kind of how it allows you to run the code in different memory isolated segments and possibly in different threads or processes. Uh, so they recently cleaned up the API. It looks, looks pretty good to me. Spawn function will create an isolate, give it a function as the entry point, which just happens that it's up here. In our simple one up here, every isolate has a port. So I can say, okay, we'll listen on a message, and uh, when I get that message, reply, just basically echo a message. Okay, cool. Um, and then down here, I'm gonna send a message via the send port. Uh, we're gonna say hi. And then when I get the response, and this is using futures, so that's cool, go ahead and print. Um, then takes a function and print is a function. Okay, cool. Just that makes sense. So let's run this. Where's print coming from? Uh, the the, the built-in. Oh, yeah. Uh, so you can't see it down here. Sorry about that. But hi, uh, here's the echo. So we sent a message. I responded. Sent it back. I got it here, and I sent that the object I got as the response to the print function. And so rice lists are really cool, and a lot of cool things happen. Yes. Print's being passed in the implicit argument here. It's not an explicit argument. Oh, oh it, it is being passed. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. I could have done this. Let's see here. Let's cool. Yeah, thanks. That, that's a good question. So I guess one thing I haven't seen in your code examples yet, uh, any kind of closure or block. Uh, so yes, we just created closure right here, okay. for instance. Yeah. yeah. In fact, uh, Dart has same closures, and if we have more time, I totally, maybe afterwards I'll show you. Um, but this in Dart is totally logical, which is really cool. Um, and I'll, I'll show you some samples like this. Um, okay, so cool. So that's what I have given the time a lot of. Um, so I totally thank you guys for spending lunch with me and the questions. And I'll just hang out for as long as you guys want and chat about all this stuff. I'd love to know. Actually, I'm really specifically interested in how much uh, kind of modern client-side web development you guys do. What are your clients asking for? Uh, because you can, we envision Dart being applicable or relevant in a world where uh, the application lives in the browser, and then the server is a RESTful JSON endpoint. 
and then you start writing your app offline first. You start writing your app with Dart or JavaScript. And just like you might in an iOS or Android app, maybe you don't, you don't ask a server to generate your Android views for you, right? And so we want, and we want to build tools to help developers build apps that are modern client-side apps. Um, and I'm totally curious if that's what you guys are trying to do, want to do, are being asked to do. Yeah, well, I guess then responding to that, um, one thing I don't think I heard you mention is what is view generation in Dart? Very astute. Uh, <laughs> the reason I did not talk about that is because that's still being worked on. That's like even more technology preview than, than what we have. Um, and I'm personally really excited for that. I can tell a little bit about the philosophy. I spent 30 seconds telling you what we think, if that would be helpful. Um, we do believe that we'll ship a, uh, like a UI app stack library with Dart. There'll be another library you get kind of bundled in. And it's going to operate on the assumptions of offline first. It's going to operate on the assumption that the view creation happens on the client. It's going to operate on the assumption of data binding, observables, events. Kind of, it's going to very much give you a very opinionated modern client side app stack. But it, it will give you those pieces like observables and views and themes and those sort of things. And are we talking about DOM element generation in a in an accessible form, or is this Dart takes over? All of your view styling, your CSS is locked. So nothing takes over anything. Right. Uh, the question was for the video: uh, Is are we talking about like accessible DOM creation and manipulation? Are we talking about like Dart taking over like the whole thing? Is that yeah. Yeah. right? Or at least the components it generates? Yeah. Do you have okay. any hope of styling them or interacting them with them with external JavaScript? Yeah. Um, for the recording, um, it was: uh, Do we have any any hope to interact with those via external JavaScript? Um, so nothing we're going to provide is going to force you into anything, that's for sure. Um, it's definitely going to have an opinion, but uh, I don't think it's even possible for us to be like, you can never ever touch this. I mean, you can always just walk the down from your job. Sure, it just might, be, yeah, it yeah. might be a good idea. Right. Uh, so one of the things we've been playing with um, is a template system that you write a snippet of HTML and it has kind of mustache-like things in it. But that, you, you actually compile that to dark code. And it takes all your HTML elements and actually generate the code, like you saw before, it'll create the elements for you. Mm -hmm. So it actually parses the HTML, creates the element, and that's statically generated for you. Uh, so then you can use those as kind of snippets, and you can actually get handles to each of the elements via IDs. So the template system will do this for you. Um, in other words, we're moving in a direction away from string manipulation on the client mm -hmm. to nodes and element manipulation. So that's kind of philosophy number one. Philosophy number two is, uh, this is something the web component spec is doing for us, uh, which is, uh, well, it's going to utilize what are called scope styles sheets. Scope style sheets are really awesome. You can say, I want to apply these styles to just this node and all its children nodes. This then allows you to kind of actually create components, which is something the web actually lacks, which is crazy yeah. when you think about it. Um, so Dart's going to play off of this theme as well. And so when you create these templates, you'll be able to also specify the CSS that goes with that block. And we will go through, parse the CSS, munge all the class names and ID names and everything for you. So that you can ship this template as an actual widget or component and have confidence that it doesn't mess with anything else. Um, so if you were relying on a particular class name outside, you know, in this particular library, that might be a little difficult. But uh, we don't think that using JavaScript to manipulate class names is the way to do it. We think you should actually write dark code and manipulate via calls in your app stack and have that manifest itself out underlying through the themes and the skins layers to manipulate CSS. Um, so in other words, we think, we think code is the right answer here, not like direct manipulation of the attributes at the application layer. Sure, but yeah. I, I think what I'm hearing is it would be hard to then have global style sheets that apply to DOM elements with known classes generated through Dart. So what I'm talking about is just a template engine. Um, okay. There's other work going on and this is why we haven't shipped yet, and so we don't improve these theories out. That does it the concept of like themes and styles, right? Um, again, we're not exactly sure what form that's going to take, but that might help manage the styles for you. Of course, you can always insert a style tag up at the top um, and do the cascade. You know, stuff might happen. But we're we're experimenting with a route where you would treat this like kind of a. Uh, a modern app on other platforms, and so you kind of do it through the libraries and APIs and the interfaces or abstraction provided by the platform, not direct manipulation of kind of attributes and CSS styles. But uh, this stuff is even more preview, so this is just what we're thinking of. 
and uh, we're trying to prove it out now. We'll see what happens. Yeah. Uh, we should follow up offline. I, mean, I, I think you're trying to go from like I want to accomplish X. I'm not fully understanding, so I'm not answering your question great. But I want to learn more about what that thing is sure. that you want to enable to do. What about what about testing support about? In terms yeah. of the tools and in terms of the libraries. Yeah, the uh, question was about testing. Uh, just last week, I think it was, um, we uh, put the unit test library into the SDK. There's a couple, there's, there were like three floating around there, and kind of like, okay, let's see people want to put it in. Um, and I know of another third party testing library too, which is really cool, so we're starting to see some choice there. Um, it's still early days, like in the core library, there is like an expects class with set functions. Um, for your low level stuff, but then you still need to wrap that in like a unit test framework. That's what we just shipped, but it's really early for that too. Um, it takes cues from like Jasmine or RSpec. So if you're familiar with those, this should look fairly, fairly familiar. Um, but what we haven't shipped, or like we kind of stopped there, it'd be interesting to see what else we or the community could do around browser level testing. Um, so we have this build bot guy that's running all these tests on all our browsers, make sure you know, check out performance, performance and conformance. Um, if you need to see, like, can we expose that more, uh, or, or encourage the community to build these kind of things for us? Yeah. It turns out that there's this tool from the Chromium project called Dump Render Tree, which is basically a headless Chrome, which is really awesome for testing, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's actually there; no one knows about it. And uh, it'd be cool if other people kind of keyed in on it and play with it because. What's better than running your app in the browser you play to and in a real life thing? Like not, not, not emulated at all, but it's headless, so it's scriptable. Almost all the tools that we use in one way or another use a headless webkit, mm -hmm. either for JavaScript for tests, tests or for you know, functional tests. So you guys are going the right direction. Can What's you, this? Sorry. Can you talk a little bit about the philosophy of error handling? Um, in terms of, I know there's like features, like how, how do errors get bubbled up through? Uh, sure, so that's, that's yeah, specific to just like features. Um, I guess I could go to the library here. Um, so are you familiar with like promises or deferreds or something like that? Just yeah, I understand. Maybe. Okay, so let's just, so I have something to talk to you here. Actually, this might not give you what you want. Well, OK. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, futures is a, is a way for you to like return a token for something that will happen in the future and allow your immediate client code to say, OK, when you get a response, do this thing. It, it, to me, it sanitizes the kind of callback heavy code. And I like futures a lot more, especially when you have a chain method. You can turn what would have been just like deeply nested or deeply spaghettified callback handles into what appears to be linear code. Um, but then at the end, you can have a handle exception method. So in this specific case of futures, if an exception is thrown inside one of the actually uh, inside the, the logic, um, your future you can subscribe to that event here. Okay, does that answer? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So the, the exception will bubble up just like the actual result, mm -hmm. which in the future the result bubbles up in, with, for instance, that. I like how futures are cool. So, I have a question. <laughs> it's kind of a broad one, so I'll preface it with that. To what ex it seems like Dart would have been better off not being not having to be compiled down to JavaScript, like <coughs> the genuine clean slate. I understand why you would want to, though, from an adoption standpoint. Oh yeah. Do you think? <coughs> my sure my question is. Uh, it. Is, it seems like the goal would be, if this is successful, really for every browser to be able to, to deal with it directly without that intermediate step. Uh, okay. Um, I don't know how much you'll cut into the video, so I'll just repeat it. Your, your point is, um, uh, same point again. How, how held back do you think Dart is by the fact that it uh, initially has to compile down to JavaScript? How know? held back do we think uh, uh, Dart is? Due to the fact that it has to compile to JavaScript, um, I don't know, but it, that I think that option is totally off the table, mm -hmm. right? Um, we, you know, Chrome loves the web. We love the web. We do this. We're all web engineers that want to see the web succeed, mm -hmm. and we have to be very pragmatic. Right? It, it, it has to compile to modern JavaScript. Now we do draw a line. Mm -hmm. We do draw a line that says, you know, legacy browsers with older implementations of JavaScript or really slow performance aren't interesting to us. Mm -hmm. Where's that line for IE? Uh, IE9 right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right now. 
Um, but I mean, it does include like uh, Chrome for Android, Mobile Safari, Safari 5.1, Firefox, basically N minus one for us. Yeah. Um, Chrome N minus one uh, right now. Um, yeah, I mean, to, to get any adoption, to help web developers uh, develop the apps we want to see land on the web, it has to deploy to the raw modern browser. And so that's just a core tenet of Dart. It's just, it's just a fact of life. Um, I think that the team's done some amazing things, like with isolates, optional types, uh, uh, the, the broad support for libraries here, that you still get in all this composite JavaScript. I mean, that's, that's pretty impressive. So I, I think the developer will still see a tremendous amount of uh, productivity gains once this gets flushed out and launches in like this like 1.0 kind of, uh, release. Uh, so yeah, just we're very proud Coffee scripts too, okay, already. Right? Yeah. yeah exactly. Let's do one more question and then we'll wrap up. What, I have a question. Um, what what is the state of support for like more advanced browser API, like um, yeah. you know, WebGL or yeah. uh, so the question was rendering or audio yeah. Did, yeah. web worker. What's the support of what's the state of support for um, the broad <laughs> HTML5 family of APIs, right? Um, so pretty good. And if it's not there, it's a bug. Um, so you can just, you know. Scroll through this thing, you'll see, okay, here's the next DB. Um, uh, down here is WebGL, here's WebSQL, um, here's SVG. So it's our intent to expose uh, all the great HTML5 APIs and features with Dart um, through the Dart HTML library. Um, absolutely. Here, I mean, here's your type to raise. Are you, are you just going to port 3JS to? We're not, but luckily somebody already did. Doesn't, I should have put it on my slide. That's another one. Yeah, there's a 3 dot Dart. That's cool. Thank you, Seth. Thank you. I'll hang around for as long as you guys have questions.